Well, good afternoon, brethren. It's good to, good to have all of us meeting together in separate places on this Sabbath day. I wish everyone a very pleasant Sabbath day, no, no matter where you are. It is awfully hard to do this without an audience. I have my son here, and uh, that's about it for here. So it's kind of strange to have a setup where you don't have an audience, but I know that uh, everyone is having a good Sabbath today. I'd like to uh, also do a shout out to four very special ladies, to, to Kay Barnett, to Nancy Miller, to Daisy Swint, and to Jean Ward. I hope all of you are having a wonderful Sabbath day as well. Well, brethren, in the year 2000, the humorous gospel singer Mark Lowry released an album containing the song, First Class, Wrong Flight, which is a humorous song about a man who wrongly gets in a plane for Omaha, Nebraska, when he was really wanting to fly to Nashville, Tennessee. The words of the song are as follows. Had to catch a plane to Nashville, but was running oh so late. Checked my luggage at the curb and prayed the plane would wait. I looked like O.J. Simpson racing for gate three. The pilot turned the engines on and I yelled, wait for me. The, plane, the flight was overbooked and there was someone in my seat, so they took me up to first class where they get real food to eat. I buckled up. We took off. Things turned out after all, until the pilot said, Welcome to your flight to Omaha. First class, wrong flight. What a situation. First class, wrong flight. Should have checked the destination. I sat t there 20 minutes just deciding what to do. I guess I could take up skydiving or hijack all the crew. I thought, why should I sweat it? I'll eat my steak and smile. It's not important where I go. I'm going there in style. Styling comfort may be grand, but it's important where you land. Make sure the way you choose is right. Well, I won't be eating peanuts or hearing something cry. I'll have a lot more leg room. It's the only way to fly. I'll get the royal treatment. Those in coach will envy me. But when we touch down, they'll be where they want to be. First class, wrong flight, what a situation. First class, wrong flight, should have checked the destination. Brethren, we live in a world today that places extremely high value on comfort, on convenience, on prosperity, on the good life, and having an easy path. Many preachers and pastors of many churches today preach a prosperity gospel, a health and wealth gospel. One famous mega church pastor preaches this health and wealth theology every Sunday. He has over 48,000 members in his one large church. He preaches that God wants only good things in our lives. Prosperity theology can be defined as a religious belief that financial blessing and physical and well-being are always the will of God. For mankind, in that faith, positive speech, and donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. Prosperity theology views the Bible as a contract between God and humans. If we have faith in God, we, He will deliver security and prosperity to us. If we have a health problem, or personal problems, or financial problems, that's because we don't have enough faith. Health and wealth is the measure of how good our relationship is with God. This doctrine emphasizes the importance of personal empowerment, proposing that it is God's will for His people to be blessed all the time. The atonement or the reconciliation with God is interpreted to include the alleviation of sickness and poverty, which are viewed as curses to be broken by your faith. The preachers of prosperity theology place all of their emphasis on the journey, not on the destination. The emphasis is on the journey, the comfort, and the pleasures of that journey. The destination is not emphasized at all. Is the health and wealth gospel correct? Did God the Father and Jesus Christ promise a pleasant and comfortable journey 
to the kingdom. Is the depth and strength of our relationship with God the Father to be measured by our health and by our wealth and by our pleasantness in life? In this sermon this afternoon entitled, First Class, Wrong Flight, I would like to explore these questions more deeply. Did God the Father and Jesus Christ promise us a pleasant and comfortable journey to the kingdom of God? To discuss this subject in more depth, I'd like to explore five points concerning our journey toward the kingdom of God. The first point concerning our journey to the kingdom of God is, it's not about the journey, it's about the destination. It's not about the journey, it's about the destination. Mankind has always been focused on the journey. And mankind wants a pleasant and comfortable journey. It's a natural desire. However, God the Father and Jesus Christ never promised a health and wealth reward in this life. Far from that, most saints in history have suffered greatly during their lives. Please turn with me to Isaiah 55. Brethren, God the Father does not think like we think. He doesn't view the world like we view it. He doesn't act in the way that we act, and He doesn't react the way that we react. In Isaiah 55, beginning in verse 8, Isaiah 55 and verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So to begin with, it is important to understand that God the Father views our lives from a completely different vantage point than we view our lives. God the Father takes a long-term, goal-oriented view at our lives. His goal and purpose with each of us is that we enter the kingdom of God. We enter His kingdom. Nothing else is more important to Him than our lives in that kingdom as a goal. Please turn with me to Luke 12. Luke chapter 12. One of the great desires of our Father is to give us His kingdom. And we read that in Luke 12 and it's beginning in verse 22. Luke 12 and verse 22. And He said unto His disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more are you better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If you then be not able to do that thing which is least, why do you take thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And seek you not what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be you doubt of a doubtful mind. For all of these things do the nations of the world seek after, but your Father knows that you have need of these things. But rather seek you the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Our destination, the kingdom of God, is the focus of God the Father. That's what he is very interested in. It is his good pleasure to give his kingdom to us. Please turn with me to Hebrews 11. Again, the history of the saints that God the Father has called out of this world has not been a pleasant one as a whole. Satan in the world hates God's way. And they have always mistreated and persecuted God's saints and called out ones. Hebrews 11 and verse 35, beginning in the middle of the verse. 
Hebrews 11 and verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. The history of the saints has been one of persecution, not one of a pleasant journey. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul was a great example of one of the saints, one of the called out ones who was used mightily by God to spread the gospel of the kingdom and to proclaim that Jesus, the anointed one, was the Son of God the Father. Yet, Paul had a far from pleasant life during his ministry. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 23 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. Paul wrote, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with, throds, with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and day I have been in the deep. In journeyings, journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren." in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He did not have a pleasant life. I don't think any of us have had to do all of that and undergo all of those tests and trials in our lives. If God the Father were more interested in the journey rather than the destination, if God the Father governed with a health and wealth doctrine, the Apostle Paul would have lived a lot more comfortable life than he actually did. If it was true for the Apostle Paul in his journey to the kingdom, the same will be true for us in our journey. The second point, brethren, concerning our journey to the kingdom of God is that we must focus on our destination. We must focus on our destination. The great baseball manager Yogi Berra made quite a few great quotes, and one that I really like is the following, If you don't know where you are going, you might wind up someplace else. It's so important to know our destination. Just like the words of the song said, Styling comfort may be grand, but it's important where you land. Make sure the way you choose is right. My wife Martha and I returned recently from a trip to Madrid and to Lisbon, Madrid, Spain, and Lisbon, Portugal, to visit our daughter, Erin, who was, until last week, studying abroad this semester in Madrid. And it is truly a God's blessing that she is now safe and sound back home here in Houston. You know, Madrid is a beautiful city and has about 6 million people in the area. The city is served by a wonderful subway system, which seemed to have stations throughout the city. Just They had stations everywhere. There are currently 10 subway lines, and the one that we use the most was Line 1, or the Blue Line. The subway stations at each end of Line 1 were Pinar de Charmartin on the far north side of Madrid and Val de Carros at the extreme far south end of Madrid. 
So when we entered the Bilboa station, subway station, which is what we used a lot because that was the closest one to where we were staying, and we wanted to go toward the heart of the city to see the museums, to see all the, the buildings and the, the, the different places to see, we, we had to know that we needed to go southward toward Val de Carros. At one major junction in the Bilboa station, we had to make a choice between going down a hallway to the platform that would take you to Pinar de Chamartin or to go down the, the hallway to take you to the platform in the direction of Val de Carros. We had to know the destination before we could make the right decision on which platform to go to. If we made the wrong choice, we'd get on the wrong train and we'd be going actually in the opposite direction of where we were wanting to go. The same is true in our lives today. Do we know where we are going in our spiritual lives? Is God's kingdom real to us? Do we really think about God's kingdom during the day? Do we meditate about what it would be like? Do we look past the trials and the tests and the tribulations and the troubles and the problems that we have on a daily basis and sometimes even just a persistent basis and focus on the kingdom? You know, in September 2008, the Houston area was hit by Hurricane Ike. The eye of the hurricane missed the, the central part of Houston. It landed to the east of the city. And for a short period of time, though, the sustained winds in Houston were still 110 miles an hour. During that storm, the winds blew an 8-foot by 6-foot section of the shingles completely off of our roof, down to the bare decking above one of the rooms on the second floor of our house. And water began to pour into the house. I was up in the attic trying to catch as much water in pails that I could. But it was to no avail. Water was just going everywhere. It truly is a helpless feeling to watch water pouring into your house. Every room of our house was damaged, either on the walls or on the floors or on the ceiling or a combination of all three. In the recovery and the remodeling of our house, that, that period of time took many, many weeks. Our house was not our house during that period of time. The furniture was all moved in different places. There was dust everywhere. Plastic sheeting was hanging in every room and in every doorway. And I remember telling Martha that we could not focus on the present and on the disastrous conditions that the house was in at the time. We would go crazy if we did. We had to focus on the future. And we had to picture in our minds how wonderful and beautiful that house would be and what, how beautiful it was going to be when all the repair work and all the remodeling work was finally finished. And that's what we did. We focused on the future. We looked past the disaster that the house was in at the time. We focused on the future, and you know, the future did indeed come. And we wound up with a better and more beautiful house than we had before the storm. Brethren, do we focus on our trials, on our tribulations, on our health issues, on our daily problems in our life, or do we focus on the future and, and do we focus on God's kingdom? If we totally focus on this life, we will become disheartened and discouraged and fearful. The Apostle Paul wrote the Corinthian congregation in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19 that if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. Brethren, we have a hope which God the Father and Jesus Christ have given us, and that hope is the kingdom of God. Without that hope, we are all miserable. 
Please turn with me to Matthew 6. God the Father and Jesus Christ want us to take a long-term view in our lives and to focus on the kingdom. Matthew 6, and verse, starting in verse 25. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. Christ said, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you should, shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is it not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow, and they toil not, and neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was, arrayed, was not arrayed like one of these. This is the parallel account that we read earlier. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall, not mu shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? God the Father is going to take care of us. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or, what, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all of these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. And then what does Jesus say in verse 33? What is the focus to be? But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Brethren, as we've read earlier in Luke 12, it is God the Father's pleasure that he gives us his kingdom. Is that kingdom the focus of our daily lives? Do we keep our minds on that ultimate destination during the day? Brethren, the third point concerning our journey to the kingdom of God is God the Father has planned our journey to get us to the kingdom. God the Father has planned the journey to get us to the kingdom, to our destination. Brethren, please turn with me to John 6, 44, a verse we all know by heart. And we will read a very well-known verse within the churches of God. God the Father has called each and every one of us. We cannot come to Christ and we cannot receive the Holy Spirit unless God the Father first calls us and draws us to Him. In John 6, starting in verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. So God the Father at some time early in our lives studied us, examined us, and chose us to be called into his way of life and to be exposed to his truth, and to be exposed to new understanding of who he is. For whatever reason, and that reason only he knows, he chose us out of seven billion people. Seven billion other people on the earth. He started a process with us that put us on a journey toward his kingdom. Please turn with me to Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20. There is a purpose for everything that God the Father does. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't do things capriciously or off the cuff. There is a specific reason why God has chosen each and every single one of us. God the Father is filling positions in Christ's kingdom for Christ's reign on earth and later in the kingdom of God itself. We read about this in Matthew 20, where James and John's mother was trying to negotiate a deal with Jesus on some of those positions and her sons. Matthew 20, and we'll start in verse 20. And then came to him Jesus, the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, 
worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What do you want? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons shall sit the one on your right hand and the other on the left in the kingdom. But Jesus answered and says, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, You shall indeed drink of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. So brethren, the positions that we will hold in Christ's kingdom are decided by God the Father and not by Christ himself. God the Father has called us into a church of believers. His church, a church headed by Jesus Christ himself. God the Father has called us and he alone is deciding what our role will be in the kingdom. And both God the Father and Jesus Christ are preparing us for that role. So the purpose of our journey is to prepare us for whatever role that God the Father has chosen for us to have in the kingdom. This is why our journeys are so different. This is why our trials and tests are so very different from one another. Many in our congregations and throughout the church are undergoing severe trials. Many times we don't understand why we are having the trials that we have. Sometimes we can feel that we just seem to go from one trial to another trial to another trial to another trial, seemingly without end. And maybe it seems that bad things just keep occurring in our lives. Brethren, our Heavenly Father is not asleep. He hasn't taken a long trip. He hasn't taken a vacation. He's not absent. We don't serve an absentee father. He and Jesus Christ know full well what we are all going through. There is a reason for everything that happens in our lives. God the Father steers events and he steers circumstances in our lives in order to produce the ultimate outcome in our lives that he desires. That outcome is entry into his kingdom. Please turn with me to James chapter 1. This is the very reason why James wrote what he wrote in his epistle concerning the trials of our journey. James 1, beginning in verse 1. Very first words in his epistle. James chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And the Greek word here for temptations is perisnos, P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S, meaning trials or adversities. Not so much temptations, but they're trials and adversities. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, and let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and, and, and entire, wanting nothing. Brethren, God the Father uses tests and trials to hone our hearts, to strengthen our resolve, to deepen our relationship and reliance on Him. Please turn with me to Daniel 12. You know, Daniel wanted to know many, many things, but was told that that knowledge was sealed and hidden until the time of the end. And we read this in Daniel 12, Daniel chapter 12, and we'll begin in verse 8. And I, Daniel, heard, but I understood not. Then I said, O oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then verse 10. Many shall be purified and made white 
and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. A main element in purification is heat. In fact, the English word purify comes from the Greek word pur, P-U-R, which means fire. God purifies us by allowing us to undergo trials and tests. Again, his main focus is on us entering into his kingdom. And he's going to do whatever it takes in order for us to enter his kingdom. Please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Have we ever wondered why in the world we are having this severe trial or that severe problem or that really out of the, out of the blue issue that has come forward? Peter discusses this question and states that trials are an integral part of the Christian life. In 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 12, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Do we ever feel that way? It's like, where did this come from? Are we surprised that we have problems and trials? In verse 13, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God resists rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. In verse 12, the Greek word for fiery trial is purosis, P-U-R-O-S-I-S, which means fiery or burning test or trial. Not just a regular test or trial, but a fiery test or trial. Again, the use of the Greek word pur or fire in the word. And fire is used to describe our tests and our trials. Brethren, God the Father has to come to a point with each and every one of us where he can say to us, Now I know. Please turn with me to Genesis 22 where we'll read a very familiar and well-known test that God the Father gave to Abraham. God had instructed Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac, as a burnt offering. Now, this was a very extreme test of faith and obedience for Abraham. Would Abraham put God the Father's desires and his will and his command above his own desires and his own will? And we read this in Genesis 22, in, beginning in verse 9. Genesis 22 and verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told uh, him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called him unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not your hand upon the lad, neither do you anything unto him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Brethren, Abraham loved his son Isaac more than just about anything else in his life. And he did not hold him back from God the Father. Please turn with me to Luke 14. Likewise, brethren, Jesus the Anointed One told his, his disciples and followers that they had to put God the Father first in their lives by forsaking everything else or they could not be Christ's disciples. We read that in Luke 14, starting in, Luke, in verse 25. Luke 14 and verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and he said unto them, If any man come to me and love not less, instead of hate it should be love less by comparison, his father 
and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he should have sufficient to, to finish it? Skipping down to verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Brethren, God the Father, the greatest and most powerful being in all the universe, is working with each one of us on an individual basis, using a tailored plan for each of us and for our salvation and for our entry into His kingdom. Brethren, the fourth point concerning our journey to the kingdom of God is we cannot coast into the kingdom. We cannot coast into the kingdom. Brethren, are our spiritual lives in a holding pattern? Are we just drifting downstream where, wherever the current takes us? Are we coasting in our spiritual lives? Please turn with me to Matthew 11. Jesus said a very strange phrase when he was teaching the multitudes concerning John the Baptist. And we read this strange verse in Matthew 11 and verse 12. Matthew 11 and verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. This verse has always been a strangely worded and little understood verse in the Bible. The Greek word for suffers violence is biazomai, B-I-A-Z-O-M-A-I, which means to lay hold of something with positive aggressiveness. The Greek word for violent in the verse is biastes, B-I-A-S-T-E-S, -S, which can mean positive assertiveness of, or one who is eager in pursuit. So Christ is saying here in verse 12 that the kingdom of heaven is laid hold of with positive aggressiveness and that those who are eager in pursuit of it will claim it. Jesus was saying that we just cannot coast into the kingdom. Brethren, are we nonchalant in our spiritual lives? Are we country club Christians? Are we getting soft in our spiritual health? Are we getting too comfortable in our daily and weekly routines? We work, we play, we come to church on the Sabbath. We sing, we listen to messages. We fellowship together when we have the opportunity to come together. All in a safe place, all in comfort, whether it's air conditioning in the, in the summertime or heating in the wintertime. It's a comfortable routine. We are living the good life. Are we becoming nonchalant, though, about keeping God's way of life and being faithful to Him? Please turn with me to Revelation 3. There is a severe warning to the church of Laodicea concerning how the good life, the pleasant life, the comfortable life can corrupt us making us soft spiritually and giving us a false image of ourselves. And we read that warning in Revelation 3, starting in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Here we go again with poor, to purify, that you may be rich in white, with white, white raiment, 
that you may, may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Brethren, if we begin to coast, if we begin to develop a Laodicean attitude toward our relationship with God the Father, brethren, we can crowd him out because we're too busy. We have a busy schedule. We're all busy. We're all doing so many things. Are we too busy to pray and to study? If the answer to that question is yes, then we must do whatever is necessary, whatever is needed to correct that in our lives and to make God the Father the priority in our lives again. Please turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. You know, if we don't do this, if we don't make God the Father and Jesus our priorities, we can become that seed falling among the thorns, as shown here in the parable of the sower and the seed. In Mark 4 and chapter th and verse 13, this is the, the description and what Christ told was the meaning of the parable. In verse 13, And he said unto them, Know you not this parable? And how, they, and how then will you know all parables? The sower sows the word. And we'll skip to verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of the world, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Brethren, there is no coasting in this perfecting process. There is no vacation. There is no respite. Satan continuously engages a full onslaught frontal attack on each and every one of us. Satan wants us destroyed. Satan wants us dead. The only beings preventing Satan from destroying us completely are God the Father and Jesus Christ. Brethren, church is not a country club. The social aspects of church are important. We are indeed instructed in Hebrews 10 and verse 25 to not forsake the assembling of the brethren together. It is beautiful for brethren to get together. But all the socializing, all the potlucks, all the activities, all the accoutrements of services and of being in a congregation do not amount to anything in our spiritual salvation if we do not have the right heart and the right relationship with God the Father. And this leads me to the fifth and final point concerning our journey to the kingdom of God, which is our Father's most important work is transforming our hearts. The, our Father's most important work is transforming our hearts. Brethren, one thing that God the Father cannot do is to make us love Him. We choose to love Him. We choose to follow and obey Him. We choose to please Him. That choice only comes through His Spirit, and through a complete transformation of our heart. Everything that happens during our, in our journey is allowed by God the Father in order to mold and soften our hearts to Him. God the Father has called us, He's chosen us, and He has worked with us with the express purpose of softening our hearts to be obedient, to be loving and respectful, and pleasing toward Him. Please turn with me to Acts 13, where we will read a passage from a sermon that Paul gave in Antioch concerning David. Acts 13, starting in verse 21. Acts 13, verse 21. And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of forty years. 
And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which who shall fulfill all my will. Brethren, are we after God the Father's own heart? How is our relationship with him? Do we yearn to be with him? Do we yearn to communicate with him? Do we yearn to pray to him and spend time with him? To study his word? Do we yearn to be obedient to him? Do we yearn to please him? You know, brethren, if we're going to spend eternity with God the Father and with Jesus, how much do we really want to be around him, them now? When we're going to spend all of eternity with them, we need to have that desire and that yearning to be with them now. The most important aspect of our calling is to transform our hearts to be in line with God the Father's heart. Brethren, in the past we've been told that the work of preaching the gospel was the most important aspect of our calling. We were told our main duty and purpose was to support that work. We heap praise and adulation on the heads of the church, the evangelists, the movers and shakers of the church on the front lines performing that work. We were told that the work that they were doing was the most important of all and that they were the most important of all. Brethren, our church is spread out across the world. Many of us are older. Many of us are by ourselves. Most, many of, not most of us are remote. We just don't have large congregations in our church. Many of us may feel very isolated and alone. Many of us may feel that we just don't play a real role in the church or that we are just insignificant. Maybe we feel because of these circumstances that we cannot and do not contribute anything to the church or the work. Brethren, this just is not true in any way. God the Father has called each one of us for a specific purpose. We just don't know what that ultimate purpose is in His kingdom. God the Father makes no mistakes. He makes no errors in judgment. Your calling is not a mistake. None of us are here by accident. All of us are important to him. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12, where the Apostle Paul discusses this very issue of the wide range of membership in the church of God. 1 Corinthians 12, and we'll start in verse 14. And I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 14, Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it less, any less a part of the body? Or if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many different parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. And in fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. 
Brethren, the biggest work that God the Father can perform is to help us transform our hearts toward Him so that we will change our hearts to respond to Him, to acknowledge Him, and to please Him as our main aspiration and as our main desire in our life. His work in us is for Him to be able to say to each and every one of us, Now I know. Yes, there is a work to be done in this end-time age. Yes, there are responsibilities to be performed. And those responsibilities need men and they need women to perform them. But the main work that God the Father and Jesus Christ are performing today is in transforming our hearts, our minds, and our thoughts. This is a very personal and private work, which is the most important work in all of the world. That most important work is being done in each and every one of us. Whether we are advanced in age, whether we are remote and by ourselves, whether we are currently in a position where we cannot physically help others in the church. God the Father's main work is accomplished by us turning to Him, yielding to Him, praying to Him, obeying Him, and desiring to please Him in every way. It doesn't matter what your health is or your intellect, or your financial status, or your circumstances in life, or any other part of your life condition. At the resurrection, God the Father and Jesus Christ can give us instant knowledge, instant abilities to do anything, instant understanding of all facts, of all history, of all languages. We will be given spiritual bodies which will never be sick, which will never tire, which will never be without boundless energy, which will never need to rest, and which will all have perfect minds, perfect recall, and perfect intellect. God the Father and Jesus Christ will give all of this to us at the resurrection. Again, one thing they cannot instantly give to us is a heart that will respond to them and will never depart from their way of love and life. This is their greatest work. And this also is our greatest work and responsibility. Brethren, God the Father and Jesus Christ never promised us a pleasant and comfortable journey to his kingdom. We naturally desire one. As a human, we want the easy way. We want a comfortable journey to the kingdom. But the truth is that God the Father uses unpleasant trials and tests in order to shape our hearts toward him. So brethren, let's remember that it's not about the journey, it's about the destination. The journey is not the end. It is the means to that end. Let's remember that we must focus on our destination. We must keep our eyes on the prize. We must keep our focus on the kingdom. Let's remember that God the Father has planned our journey to get us to our destination, the kingdom of God. God is honing and shaping us in the journey in which He is leading us. We all have different and unique journeys. Let's remember that we cannot coast into the kingdom. We cannot stop striving and we cannot stop overcoming. We cannot drift. We cannot fall asleep in our comfort zones. Let's remember that our Father's most important work is transforming our hearts. His plan of salvation for us will not work if we do not respond to Him, if we don't love Him, if we don't earnestly yearn to please Him in everything we think, everything we do, and everything we say. In closing, please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. The Apostle Paul knew that he was going to be executed and that he would be put to death shortly. He knew that his life was at an end. Paul did not have a pleasant life. He did not have a pleasant journey, as we've read earlier. Yet even in the suffering of awaiting his impending death, 
he remained positive. He learned to be content in whatever state that he found himself in. He always focused on the destination, and he was confident that he would reach that destination and that he would be in the kingdom. And we read that in 2 Timothy 4, when in the last, well, this was the last epistle, and this is at the end of that last epistle. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. Paul wrote, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. Brethren, in his closing remarks, he mentions us and all the saints who love God's appearing. We will all receive a crown of righteousness when we reach our destination. As told in the song, First Class, Wrong Flight, we can have a very pleasant journey. We can be the envy of everyone else with our comforts. We can have the easy life, a very, very pleasant life. And we can totally wind up in the wrong destination with a very bad ending. It's not about the journey. It's about the destination. Brethren, let's remain positive in our outlook. No matter what circumstances, trials, tests, problems, troubles, or tribulations that we may be facing, let's look past those issues and let's focus our attention on our ultimate destination the incredibly wonderful, joyous, and exciting kingdom of God.